Hello and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. Get out your Bibles. Okay, it's important. Get out your Bibles, write in them, make your notes, do what you need to do. Um, you don't care what I say, you want to know what God has to say. Um, if you never caught it from the beginning, I'm actually following the teachings at Creekside Messianic, John 1415.org. That's where I get a lot of my information from. Amazing teacher, teaches the Bible book, chapter, verse, and defines scripture with scripture. Um, if you ever want to go back down near the end of the scroll, you can see Matthew and you can hear his teachings that he did on this, which I am taking these teachings from. I do it on a different level because his students have been with him for a long time. So I, I try to add a little more here and there. Um, last week, we finished up at Matthew, what was it, Matthew 8, 13, with G Jesus healing a centurion servant. I would like to get through all of chapter 8 today. But I don't think we're going to do it. I think it's just too much to do. Um, and it's kind of cool because what Matthew 8 teaches, if you look at it as an entire chapter, you see Messiah cleansing a leper. That's like unheard of. I mean, there was they had prescriptions and things you would do and procedures you would follow for a man that was healed from leprosy. But Messiah showed that he, as God, had power over leprosy. He also healed the servant with just a word, the servant's son. I know it says the, excuse me, the centurion's son. I know it says the, a lot of the verses say that it was a servant, but there's two different words there. It was son because another word was used for servant further down. So he had power over that with healing, with sickness, with disease. And we saw that again when he healed Peter's mother-in-law. We will continue to see that today. When a man, um, when he heals many people, we're also going to see where um, Messiah goes out in a boat, the waves are coming over the boat, the disciples are freaking out. And he says, hey, you have little faith. Oh my goodness, there's so much in that little phrase. We'll talk about that. But Messiah shows that he has power over nature, that he has power over wind over the, the ways he has power over nature. And then we're going to see that he heals demon-possessed men um, up in the cemetery. You will see that Messiah has power over demons. His word is amazing. It's the word he created everything, and we know that word was his because in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And further down, he said, and the word became flesh. Um, chapter 8 follows chapter 7, duh, obviously. Um, the Sermon on the Mount, amazing. This is where Messiah lays out his ministry, kind of. Um, a lot of this is talking about the kingdom of heaven and what it takes to get to the kingdom of heaven. Elsewhere, it's referred to as the kingdom of God. Matthew was written to the Jews. I mean, not that it's not for us, it's for everybody, but it's slanted toward the Jews so that they would believe. You don't say God. That's why it was the kingdom of heaven. Um, and this is not, the Sermon on the Mount is not something to be taken verse by verse by verse. Yes, there's a lot of good things in there, but it flows. Messiah is not ADHD. Messiah is not just filling out a bunch of random thoughts on a paper. He's, it's a masterful speech, a sermon. Wow, it all flows. And it ends with, um, it ends with, it's interesting, talking about fruit. Good fruit can't come from a bad tree. Bad fruit can't come from, from a, a good tree. And then he says, and then he's talking about being aware of false prophets in this. Um, but then he says, many will come to him in the last day saying, have I not done this, done that, done this? In other words, look at my fruit. And Messiah will say, I never knew you. Saddest words anybody could ever hear, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness, the condition of being without Torah, by choice or ignorance. You know, right, wrong, what's the standard? Did God give us a standard? Yeah, it's in Torah. That's the standard. I know that's going to upset a lot of people. But that's okay. That's what the Bible teaches. You who practice lawlessness, the condition of being without Torah, by choice or ignorance. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this teaching. We're picking up at verse um, 14. And again, I'm hoping to get through all of this today. Probably not. Probably going to be this weekend, next week, to finish Matthew 8. 
Um, so he goes into Peter's house to heal his mother-in-law. Now, Jesus had come into Peter's house. Where is this? He's in Capernaum. That's where Peter's house would have been. That's where Messiah, through scriptures, at least his ministry, um, he saw his wife's mother, um, his wife's mother laying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and served him. My first takeaway is, hey, you know, God comes and he heals you. Messiah heals you from something. You serve him. He touches your life. He does amazing things. You serve him. And it's many times the places where we were weak, the places where he healed us, becomes our places of strength where we can serve others. Um, other interesting things at play here is he sealed immediately. Um, it was a common thought of that day that sickness comes from sin, and we'll see that elsewhere. That sickness comes from sin. You're sick, you have issues and all these things because of sin in your life. Is that true? Well, no. But yes. What do you mean, no and yes? Well, it's true because it was the sin of Adam, which we all suffer from, that brought that brought sickness and disease and everything into the world. Okay, but it's into the world, and it comes upon everybody, just like the rains fall on the just and the unjust alike. There was also a common um, thread or a common understanding in this day was that you didn't touch the unclean. The sick people, they're unclean. You're going to get the sickness. You're going to become unclean. You don't touch them. You didn't touch a leper. The lepers were, had to go through town saying, unclean, unclean, and everybody run away from them. And they, they lived on the outskirts. We talked about that last week. But you didn't touch them because they were afraid that you were going to be unclean, that, that they were going to make you unclean. Well, Messiah, the first thing he does is touch. he touched her hand. Was Messiah afraid of touching someone? No. Messiah healed her. She became clean when she touched Messiah. Messiah has that effect on people. Um, let's go to verse 16. When evening came, they brought him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out spirits with a word. And he healed those who were sick. Wow. You know, it's interesting. Um, you, know, you ever notice reading the Bible, there was a whole lot of demon-possessed people back then? Yeah. Do you think we have demon-possessed people now? Yeah, we do. Um, maybe there's different ways of describing and explaining it, but yeah, we still have demon-possessed people. Um, and I'm not talking exorcist, okay? Something different. Um, I just don't think that, I, I believe we still do have demon-possessed people. Do you notice, um, where am I? give me a second, he speaks with a word, and he heals people with just a word. There is power in the word of Messiah, as we just talked about. Um, you know, I can't help when I'm thinking about the word of Jesus, how much power is in it. He created the beginning with his word. Um, we saw where heaven and earth will pass away, but actually it's in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. His word is eternal. Um, what else was I thinking of the word? Oh, when he comes at Armageddon, he fights with the sword that's out of his mouth. That is the word. Uh, the sword of the, is the word. And in, what is it? Psalm 2, he speaks, it's over. Just with a word. Well. Wow. Is there, now this is, okay, let's read 17. That's what I'm, that's why I'm like confused here. But let's read 17. So he did all this so that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Hmm. Where is that in the word of Isaiah? It's in Isaiah 53. What is Isaiah 53 all about? It's all about Messiah. It's pretty cool. Let's go there. And I, I need to do that one from my Bible. I know I need to be doing my looking at the computer. That way I'm not having my head down here. But I've got so many notes, oh my goodness, in Isaiah 53. And we're going to walk through Isaiah 53 a little bit. Um, and there's some things in here. You know, this is a, a good Christmas 
hmm, we don't really do Christmas anymore. But this is something that they read on Christmas about the birth of Messiah. But it's beyond that. It's way beyond that. And you're going to see that not everything in here is talking about his birth. In fact, most of it is not. So we're going to start with Isaiah. Now, where do we want to walk through? Let's start at 1. Yeah, let's start at Isaiah 1, 53, 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The arm of the Lord is understood that it is Messiah. Um, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a dry root from the dry ground. He has no form of humbleness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. It's not like he has this external, like, oh, you know, just wonderful, and everybody flocks to him. He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it were our faces from him. What does it mean he was despised by men and rejected? The the ruling elite and the and all the people in, in Israel did not accept who he was. If they had, things would be a lot different now. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Same thing. Surely. He has borne our griefs. Ah, you know what? I was actually thinking we were in Isaiah 9. We'll get there later. That's about the birth of Messiah. My apologies. Surely he was born our griefs. And he carried our sorrows. That's that same scripture. But it's different words. Yeah, it is different words. Let's look up what these words mean. Actually, I have it here. I went into the Blue Letter Bible. He bore our griefs. The word griefs actually translates as sickness and disease. He took them on him. He cured them. And, and carried our sorrows. Sorrows, this is really cool. This is really cool. Pain. Physical and mental. That covers a lot. All these things we have going on. Physical, mental, those pains, those aches, those issues that bother him. This is what he cures. Um, sorrow, anguish, affliction. This is what this scripture tells us. Let's keep reading. So that, because this is just really talking about Messiah here, let's keep reading. Keep in mind that Isaiah wrote one, uh, 700 years before Messiah was born here on earth. So where are we at here? Smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, for our sin. Wounded is a bad word. It's pierced. He was pierced for our transgressions. Sound familiar? He was bruised for iniquities. <laughs> bruised, another bad translation. It should be crushed. Like, and, and that would give you the picture of an olive press where they would crush the, the olives. And the Garden of Gethsemane was, they had olive presses there. We'll get there later to the Garden of Gethsemane. But that was an olive place and they would crush the olives there. What comes out of the olives when you crush them? Olive oil. What is oil? The, 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 um, spirit, the, excuse me. What is oil a picture of? The spirit. It was through his being crushed, his being pierced. His crucifixion that the Holy Spirit would come. Isn't that cool? The chastisement of peace was upon him. He is the Prince of Peace. And by his stripes we are healed. Think about the cat of nine tails that they would whip him with. And the stripes, actually, if, if you don't understand what the cat of nine tails was, um, they actually, it's not just a whip. They would like, tie in little pieces of broken pottery, uh, rocks, different things, uh, so that it would actually rip the flesh as it would do that, as they would whip him. Like sheep, we have all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Wow. Makes me think of John 14, 6. Let's go there real quick. Yeah, it's funny, you know, we say that we are studying Matthew, but see, Matthew pulls from the, all of the Gospels. They pull from everywhere in Scripture. So when we're really doing a Bible study in Matthew, we're studying the Bible, period. You probably picked that one up by now. John, oh, wrong place, sorry. John 
14, verse 6. I am the way, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's all the lost sheep that he will gather. He is the good shepherd. So much in the good shepherd. Oh, my goodness. Uh, we'll probably get there eventually, and we'll talk more about the shepherd as we go further in the book of Matthew. Because uh, it's, you know, you get the good shepherd and, you know, stuff in the New Testament and the Gospels. But when you take it back into the prophecies, into the prophets, it's really cool. Um, let's go ahead and go back to Matthew. No. Here we go. I need to put my little marker here so I can get back to it. Actually, I'm going to go and work off the computer screen instead. So let's go back to Matthew. There's a couple places where I need to use my Bible because I just have a lot of notes there. And I mean, and if you're studying, you should have lots of notes in your Bibles as well. Seriously. It's because, you know, you come across something, you get something, write it in the margins. You can use pencil, you can use pen, whatever you prefer. But so that when you read it again, you're like, oh, yeah, now remember that. So what we what we've learned in this in the, in our last week's Bible study is that Messiah has power over everything that can ail us, any of our aches, pains, whatever. He has power over it. And if we're not healed here, we will be uh, risen incorruptible. I used to think about like you know corruption and like you know um, as a character type thing. But also corruption is what happens to our bodies as we age and we ache and we pain and everything. We're going to have incorruptible bodies. No more sickness, no more pain, no more anything. Wow. Yeah. Um, verse 18, and Jesus saw the great multitudes about him. And he said, oh, what a great teaching opportunity. Wait, that's not what it says. It says, and he gave a command to depart from the other side. Why would he do that? You've got a great multitude, all these people. He could have another big sermon, but he didn't. Why? Um, this is kind of reading between the lines, uh, but it makes sense when we see everything else that we're going to be reading in Matthew. It wasn't his time. Um, the Messiah has a three-and-a-half-year ministry. If he had great multitudes flocking to him everywhere, what do you think the ruling elite is going to think? Yeah, they're not going to be happy. They're going to be jealous. And what it is, is that they're afraid they're going to lose their power, their wealth, their positions. And it goes on and on. And as we go further, I actually, when I did this last Bible study, I came to understand that they really did know who he was. And because they were afraid of upsetting Rome, and having Rome come in and destroy them, and they were afraid of losing their powers, and that's why they wanted to crucify him. Now, the scripture doesn't actually tell you that, but we'll, we'll talk about that as we go further down. And you'll see little hints that that very much, much would be what would hap what hap what happen. Um, let's read further. We're going to read into these things a little bit. Could I be right? Yeah, could I be wrong? Maybe. But I think it will make sense as I explain it. And a certain scribe came to him and said, Teacher, I'll go. I will follow you wherever you go. It's interesting. First of all, what is a scribe? A scribe is a is the one that, yes, he would take care of the, the scrolls. He would be meticulously copying them, you know, verse by verse, although they didn't have verses then, um, word by word, letter by letter. But they were considered to be the experts on the law. They were considered to be like lawyers. And if the Pharisees or somebody had a question about a biblical interpretation, they would turn to the scribes because the scribes were knew the scripture better than anybody because of the time they spent with it. Um, but what's interesting is Messiah's response to this. Okay, and it makes doesn't make sense. At the beginning, like if you, unless you really think about it, when the Messiah responded, they said, "Hey, I'll follow you wherever you want to go." They took a second. Foxes have holes, and birds of air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What does that mean? 
I don't have a house. I don't have money. I don't have a, even a place to lay down. I don't have any material wealth. I don't have power and prestige. I don't, I mean, he has power. But from a worldly standpoint, he doesn't have all those things. And Messiah definitely can read into Messiah's, I mean, excuse me, this scribe's thinking. And the scribe didn't come back and said, I don't care about those things. I just, you. No, that's not what he said. We never hear from this particular scribe again, or at least there's nothing in scripture that tells us we hear from him again. He didn't follow him. You know, he wasn't willing to pick up his cross, although they didn't talk about picking up a cross at that point because Messiah hadn't been crucified. But the, the thought behind it that you're willing to give up for him and you're not trying to get earthly gain. So what this scribe had was a heart condition issue with the heart. Then somebody else came to him, and another of his disciples. This doesn't mean it's one of the 12 disciples. What is this disciple? Is a student. A rabbi is a teacher. A disciple is a student. Said to him, Lord, they go and first bury my father. But Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. More than likely, this guy's father wasn't actually dead. He wanted to go and help put his affairs in order, get his inheritance and all of that. Yeah, hard issue. Again, I'm reading between the lines. I can't say that it definitely is what happened, but um, that seems to be what happened. But let's go back up to verse 20, and I want to look at a phrase there. Give me a second here. I just want to get myself together. Okay. Back in 20, we see the phrase, Son of Man. Messiah calls himself the Son of Man. What is he saying? Well, literally, the Son of Man is basically like the Son of Adam that I am flesh and bones, just like any other human. That's what Messiah had to be flesh and bones, because he is going to be a kinsman redeemer. Um, and, you know, you go back to the story with Ruth, and that's a picture of Messiah as a kinsman redeemer. But there's more to it. It's a lot deeper than that. Let's go back to Matthew. Or excuse me. Let's go back to um, Daniel. Daniel 7. He's actually saying, hey, I'm God. Actually, I want to do this out of my Bible because I have notes. 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 I can't th help but think about the presentations I was involved in with, in church doing drama for many years. And our director, a lady, beautiful lady named Donna. Uh, beautiful spirit. He would always be like, I've got nothing. Good memories. Um, we're going back to Daniel 7. As I'm talking and flipping aimlessly. Daniel 7. And we're going to pick up, what is it, 14? <laughs> Where are my notes? Um, 13 and 14. And this is a vision that... that Daniel had, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with, with the clouds of heaven. Who is that Son of Man? It's Messiah, that God. Thanks the Lord. What does it mean, coming with the clouds of heaven? It's Matthew 24. It's Revelation 19.11. It's the end of tribulation when Messiah comes back and all the armies with him, all the saints with him for Armageddon. You know, a lot of people like think, yeah, you know what, I can fight, but I might be fighting that day. No, we don't fight. We're just witnesses. Read Psalm 2. He just speaks and it's over. Um, he came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Then he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. He's given a kingdom. Where do we see that? Isaiah 9. Um, we're going to go there in a minute. Um, that all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him. Now, is this for Jews or Gentiles? It's for everybody. His, that's um, Revelation 5, 9 and 10. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, if he is just flesh and bones, a oh, man, how does he have an everlasting kingdom? Because you know, somebody's going to die eventually. No, he's God. He is God. This does take us to Isaiah 9, where I thought we were going earlier. Isaiah 9, 
Mm, is this the one? No, this is not. I've got some pages ripped out of here. So this is not one of them, luckily. It's Psalm 22 that's whipped out of my Bible. Yeah, I love that one. Anyhow, um, we're going to pick up here just six and seven. And this is the one that you'll know that uh, a lot of Christian churches will read at a Christmas mass or whatever. But I don't think we get the full understanding of what it was. And I was blown away when I saw this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. Well, was the government upon his shoulder when he was here in his first coming? No. See, there's two different words being used. A child is a newborn baby that was born, Feast of Tabernacles, uh, many thousand years ago. A son is not a baby. That's a man. That's a, that's an adult. Um. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. It will happen. He shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Get rid of that little in there. That is actually one thing. He is a Wonderful Counselor. His name, um, Mighty God. Mighty God. John 1.1. 1, 1. Everlasting Father. Right. Translation. It actually translates the Father of Eternity. No beginning, no end. So, the Prince of Peace. And the increase of his of the government, the increase of the government and peace, there will be no end. So when Messiah comes back, there is no end to his government. And there's no end to the peace. And upon the throne of David over his kingdom. And it and to order an establishment with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Oh, that's important. Lord of hosts is an end times prophecy, like buzzword. Host is a military commander. This is Messiah coming back at Armageddon. That's when this happens. And that's when his kingdom gets set up. There's something else in here that's interesting. The increase of his government, and I can't prove this one. The person who I learned from is a, he teaches advanced Hebrew. In here, there's a letter, there's a little Hebrew letter in that word that has like, that's normally the begin, beginning or the end of a word. And Hebrew letter, the language is really complex. But in this word, it's in the middle. And it's like a closed box. And I, I couldn't tell you what the letter is. And the sages, many, many years ago, said, oh, that's a closed womb. It was for that reason, long before Messiah came here, that the ancient Jewish sages taught that he would be coming um, as an immaculate conception, you know, a virgin birth. And it's actually kind of cool. But that's what in there, in the Hebrew, hidden in there, and Hebrew words are pretty wild. Um, we're going to be talking about this in another video I'm going to be doing about the Aleph and the Tav. But in Hebrew words, each word is a word, each letter are words. So a word can be a sentence. Um, it's more of where, whereas English is like, if you've been to an English class, everything's like, if you're in America or England, whatever, you've been to an English class. But that the, you know, Greeks, same way, everything is like all these rules specific, whatever. Hebrew is more fluid, and it's more about ideas and concepts, and things can be taken several different ways. And that's how that we get, like, the sodes, the things that come out that weren't meant to be understood before. Um, I'll give you one example of this in the, um, what is it? Um, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. It, between beginning and God, and actually the words are a little different because Hebraic construct is different. But you will find an olive and a tov, two letters in there, which never gets translated. You don't know what it means. And there's all through the Old Testament you find these. Well, it wasn't until John wrote the book of Revelation when he said, I am the olive and the tov. When you go back to John 1, 1, or Genesis 1, 1, that actually reads in the beginning, God, through Messiah, created. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it's a very complex language, and I am not a Hebrew scholar at all. Luckily, I learned from a person that is. Um, so let's go ahead and go back to Matthew. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's definitely not. This is we're definitely not going to get through this uh, the rest of this chapter today. That's okay. I learned a long time ago. It's not about how far you get into a book that you're studying. It's how much you get out of it, not how quickly you get through it. It's important. All right. So oh, we got to go down here. And maybe we'll get there. We'll see. All right. So now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed. That's what disciples do. They're followers. And suddenly there was a great a tempest rose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves. She was asleep. Wow, I wish I could sleep that soundly. A great tempest, a great storm. What sea is this? Is it the Mediterranean? No, this was the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is not huge, but it's very deep. And it is known for these nasty hurricane-like storms to pop up, you know, out of nowhere. And that's commonplace there. Um, that says that the boat was covered with the waves. That doesn't sound good. What happens when these open little boats get covered with waves? They sink. These disciples are freaking out. Okay, let's keep reading. His disciples came to him and woke him saying, Lord, saints, we are perishing. What is his response? He said to them, Why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Not faith, but a little faith. So he rose and rebuked the waves and the, the winds and the sea, and it was a great calm. All right. So, well, let me ask you this. What if one of the disciples was out there and they rebuked the wind and the sea? What's going to happen? They're going to drown. What if you or I were there and we rebuked the waves and the sea? What's going to happen? We're going to drown. This is showing that Messiah has power over nature, all types of nature. You think back into Revelation. No, okay. Do I have the verse written here? No, I want to say it is somewhere around 11, 12, 13, 8, 14, where the angels hold back the wind. Um, 13. And, and it's talking about the 144,000, I believe. Um, who controls the angels? Messiah. No controlling the wind. Messiah controls the wind. Messiah controls, has power over everything of nature. That's what this is telling us. Um. Where do you want to go? Give me a second. The other thing is they had little faith. He said, you have, you have little faith. Is he being mean, cruel? No, he's being obvious, honest. The longer they spend, these disciples spend with Messiah, the more faith they get. And it's really not until they see him arise that they really get faith. And pretty much all the disciples gave their lives for him. That's how much faith they had. So the, the takeaway here is the more time we spend with Messiah, the more time we spend in his word, and the word is Messiah. The scripture is Messiah. The more time we spend there, the more time, the more faith. We go from having a little faith to a lot of faith, like the disciples did. But why did he say ye of little faith? Well, the scripture tell us how Messiah would die. Yes. Does it tell us that he is going to drown? How is he going to die? He's going to be crucified. Where do we see that in Scripture? And that's Psalm 22. So let's go back there and take a look at that. Psalm 22 is really cool. Actually, before we go to Psalm 22, we, we got to go to Matthew 27, 46 first. We're going to jump ahead. We'll get here later, and we'll go through this again, and we'll, we'll all have forgotten what I'm saying by that point. Um, but anyhow, Messiah, really not. This is one of those takeaways that it's like one of those aha moments where it's like, oh, my goodness, but I was always taught this. It's what Scripture says. Um, and Psalm, I'm sorry, Matthew 27, 46. I'm still scrolling down here. Messiah is on the cross. He said it was about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, 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 Eli lama 
Sabatian, or whatever. I'm terrible with pronunciations of these words. I know most people are. It's okay. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many sermons have you heard? Well, God had to forsake Jesus because Jesus was going to go down and preach the gospel to those people down in hell. Um, hmm. Actually, what he did is he went down and he emptied out Abraham's bosom. Those people, the waiting place. It's not necessarily hell. There's a word. I'm not coming up with it right now. Um, Hades, I believe, is the other side. And people are still there waiting for the great white throne judgment. But he emptied them out when, um, and brought them back to heaven at that point. At least the, the spirits, not the bodies. That comes later. Um, another teaching. I actually did a whole teaching on hell that's very detailed. You might want to take a, check, a look at that. But... Um, how can God forsake himself? If God's forsaking Messiah, then is Messiah not God? No, Messiah is God. He said he was over and over. So on earth, he wasn't. But he was, but he wasn't. And I mean, I've heard this over and over. And people go to great lengths to defend this, but there was nothing in Scripture that tells you he's not God, except maybe this. See, there's this concept, this understanding that rabbis of his day would have and disciples of his day would have you know, is if you mention something from scripture they're expecting you to go back be Bereans, go back and dig into it and look into it and see what is he trying to say so that's what we're going to do we're going to go to psalm 22 which was written 1000 years before this happened well, maybe not exactly 1000 years but about 1000 years in psalm 22 how does it start? To the chief musician, set to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. Scripture tells us that David was a prophet. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what Messiah is pointing us to, using these exact words. He does this over and over, and we're going to see it more and more as we go along. Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, um, we're going to go down to, um, let's skip down to 14, just for time's sake. I am poured out like water. Remember, blood and water came out of his side when he's pierced. And all my bones are out of joint. Well, yeah, he's been hanging on a cross. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like pots for I'm not sure what that exactly is. And my, my tongue clings to my jaws. Yeah, I'd be thirsty too if I was out there. You have brought me to the dust of death. Your dogs surrounded me. Why would dogs do that? You know, I'm sorry, I love dogs. So in defense of dogs, let's look up what this means. Any dog lovers out there? I'm sure there are. This word dogs has a different meaning. And you see the dogs, like don't cast off your pearls, the swine dogs are listed there. Dog, here's the definition. Dog literal, contempt or abasement, a pagan sacrifice, a male cult prostitute. Um, I'm going to read down a little bit more. Caleb, whatever, how you pronounce that, Caleb? From an unused root means to yelp or else to attack. A dog, hence, by euphemism, a male prostitute. Does this mean that there were a bunch of male sexual prostitutes around Messiah? No, that's not what it means. These are male prostitutes because they have sold themselves out. They have sold themselves out maybe to pagan idols. They have sold themselves out to Rome. And they, the, the shepherds were bad shepherds. They had sold out the job they were supposed to be doing of leading people to Messiah. That's what a that's what a priest would do, is to lead people to Messiah. That's his job. Um, they sold themselves out. They were doing it for the money, for the wealth, the prestige. Um, yeah, we'll take this. We'll take a little another little side trip. Isaiah fifty six. Isaiah fifty six is about salvation for the Gentiles. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah, the salvation for everybody is by grace through faith. Um, 
So let's let's see this. How they use the word dogs here. Starting Isaiah 56 and 9, this is about the bad shepherds. All you beasts of the field, some little devour, all you beasts of the forest. In other words, if the shepherds aren't doing their job and protecting the flock, the beasts are going to come. If the, if the priests aren't doing their job, all the bad teaching, all the pagan idolatry and everything is going to creep in. His watchmen are blind. They are ignorant. They are dumb dogs. Again, in the sense of dogs, these are people who have sold themselves out to the wrong thing. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving the slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, in it for the wealth, for all the ties that they get, um, which they never have enough. They are, and they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way. Is that what a shepherd's supposed to do? No, a shepherd's supposed to lay down his life for the flock, like Messiah did. Free one for his own gain, from his own territory. He, one says, I'll bring the wine. And we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today. And much more abundant. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. And it's not that the law was bad. It's not that the prophets were bad. It's that it had been twisted, just as we talked about in Matthew 5, how they were twisting things and Messiah was reteaching. A little bit off track, but that's okay. Um, I have to defend dogs. I love dogs. Let's go back to Matthew 8. All right, and where are we at here? Give me a second. So that's why he said, why are you faithful? Why are you so fearful? Oh, ye of little faith. See, they weren't clicking that this is the Messiah. This is God. I mean, they got it, but they didn't really get it. They had a little bit of faith, but not a lot of faith. And this tells you, you can, you can have faith, but not have a lot of faith in faith grows as you walk in it, as you keep walking in it, that faith can grow and grow and grow. So if you think, I don't have enough faith, just closer to Messiah. If you think Messiah's gone and left you, um, closer. He doesn't leave. We turn, we go our ways. We need to come back sometimes. He arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and here, and, and here was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, who can this be? That even the wind, the winds in the sea obey him. The light bulbs are starting to click on. Da -ding! You know, they're getting it and they're getting more faith. Um, we're at 43 minutes. There is, hmm, do I want to go on and finish this? Yes, I will. Hang with me. This is cool. Right. Um, we're going to, we're going to go through the two demon, uh, two demon possessed men. I know in Luke it's one. I'm not going to try to discuss why Luke has one and, uh, Matthew has two, but let's not worry about that. Um, I don't know the answer to that one. I'm sure there is one, but anyhow. So let's click ahead real quick and look at something. Just I want to make a point here before we get started. Go to Matthew 9. Verse 1, and this is after everything's over. What do they do? So he got into a boat and crossed over and came to his own city, back to Capernaum. So when you see this story that we're about to un that's about to unfold before us of the demon possessed possession in this graveyard, um Messiah went a great distance. It's one or two people, whether it's one or two. He went a great distance and then came back. There, he could have done other stuff along the way. We don't know, but there is no record of anything else he did. So Messiah will go great distances to get that lost sheep and bring them back. So anyway, I think that's a really important thing for us to understand. Because a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, yeah, Messiah is not going to come to me. One of the saddest things I, I, I did, I mean, it was back during COVID when restaurants started to open up and right lived, everybody was freaking out. And I'm like, great, I get to go into restaurants, no lines, get a table right away. The servers aren't busy. I get great service. And there was this young lady there, probably 
early 20s or so. And we had a guy conversation. Amazing how that comes up when you bring it up the right way. And she confided with me. She's like, I don't, you know, there's no way God can help me. I'm like, why not? But I've had sex outside of marriage. And I'm like, don't you understand? You're the one he came for. You know, with that Satan, that Satan that's just sitting here saying, well, you've done this, you've done that. You've done all these terrible, terrible things. Um, God would never want you. That's who Messiah came for. All, every every saint, and a saint, a saint is just someone who's sent, uh, set aside. It's not like, you know, something and I've been knighted or whatever they do to saints. No, a saint is just someone who's been set aside where their eternity is assured. Um, but every saint's got a past. We all have pasts. But you know what? Every sinner has a future. And it's smoking or non-smoking, you know, heaven, um, the kingdom of heaven, or a lake of fire. They all have a future. We just need to be clock ticking, running out of time. Got to uh, have Messiah. Got to share Messiah so that people don't end up in that lake of fire. If, if someone gets into the lake of fire, do you know you get out? You know. Right, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting making this longer, but that's okay. I think this is important. Let's go back to Matthew in the 23 and go back to our the text here. And this is not the right place. I'm in 28. That doesn't work. Matthew 8. Yeah, this is why I don't have like, I just got click and scratch and little notes here and there. Um, I just pray that God speaks through me. And if I take a rabbit trail, I take a rabbit trail. It's okay. Um, so when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, where he met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. A lot of times in Scripture, you don't know exactly where Messiah is. This is the time that we know exactly where he is. He's on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, on the Jordan side. And this place, the Gergesenes, is a, is a town in the district of Gadara. Um, and this is important. And we're going to see this in a little bit because knowing this context and knowing what happened there is going to give us a lot because he's going to cast the demons out in the pigs. It's going to tell us something about the pigs, which is actually pretty cool. Um, the story is the pigs, not so much. They didn't have a good, good ending to this. But let's go ahead and, and read through. But came to the other side of the countryside of Gersi, he met two demon possessed tombs coming out of, or two demon possessed men coming out of the tombs. What does that first tell you about them? They're unclean. They're exceedingly fierce that no one would pass that way. So these are some seriously demon possessed men freaking people out. Um, I think it's in Luke. It talks about how they tried to chain them and they broke the chains and they were cutting themselves. They were like the first cutters. Um, you know, they've got some serious, serious issues, but Messiah came a long distance for some people with some serious, serious issues. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have you to do? What, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, you, you son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? There is so much packed in there that we want to unpack. That's pretty cool. First of all, um, the Scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel are not going to get and accept Messiah, or Jesus as their Messiah. These demons knew who he was. Yeah, they're fallen angels. They maybe maybe they were up there in heaven with him before they came they before they fell. And they know who he is. What does it mean that um what does it mean? Have you come to what's the exact wording here? Give me a second. Come to torment us before our time. They know when that time is. They know that their time to get tormented is in a lake of fire at the end of tribulation. And it's not, excuse me, at the end of the millennial kingdom. And it's not the millennial kingdom. So what is he doing messing with us now? Um, it's like, did God change what he's going to do? Did Messiah decide, hey, 
you know, I'm going to change this up and we're going to do this prophecy thing a little different and we're going to come and torment you now. Well, he can't do that. Why can't he do that? Um, go with me to Psalm 89. Give me a second. And we're going to look at, I'm pulling it up on my phone just so I don't lose this. Um, Psalm 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. So God does not break covenants. Understand the new covenant, it's actually renewed, just like a new moon is not a new moon. God doesn't have a rock crusher where he breaks the moon and then creates a new moon. It's renewed, if you look in the wording there. Um, but he says, nor alter the word that comes out of my mouth. If God changes, if Messiah, who is God, changes something prophetically, he's a liar. He says he's not a liar. So that's why they're confused. There's another phrase in there that's interesting. What um what have you to what have we to do with you? Well, Paul explains this. Let's go to was it Second Corinthians six? And we're going to start. Uh, we're just going to look at thirteen through fifteen. Um, now in return, why does this not look right? It's not right. Oh, yeah, it is. I'm sorry. We're going to start in verse 14. My apologies. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord does Christ with Belial, with Satan, with demons? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? These are all opposites, polar opposites. So it's not, not like Christ is going to come and say, hey, you know what, let's have some dinner together. Let's break bed. Let's you know, sit around and sing Kumbaya by the fire, whatever. He has no accord with them. That's what the demons are saying. That's exactly what the demons are saying. What do, what do you, you have to do with us? What do we have to do with you? We're not going to hang out. We're not going to party. We're not going to do whatever. We don't do this together. They are polar opposites. Keep in mind that righteousness and lawlessness are opposites. What's lawlessness? Look at the definition. It's a condition of being without Torah by choice or ignorance. That is the opposite of righteousness. You can't be in. All right, let's go back to Matthew. And we'll try to wrap this up maybe a little quicker than I thought. You know we're approaching 53 minutes. Um, what else do you want to take out of here? So I just did a teaching. Maybe it's tomorrow it comes out. I forget. But anyhow, no, it's today. But be careful, little ears, what you hear. See, this mixing of like things that don't go together. Uh, mixing God with pagan idolatry, mixing God with the world. The church in Laodicea, we're not going to go there um, time-wise, with lukewarm. Uh, how do you get lukewarm? Mixing things of uh, hot water with cold water gives you lukewarm. That's one way of looking at it. Uh, but it's when you have one foot in heaven and one foot in hell. You're going to church, you're going out and doing whatever you want. Or where she went. You're bringing things of the world into the church to get more believers. I'm not going to get go. I could go on and on about that. There's another, if you look up the definition of the word lukewarm, it only appears once in Scripture. Figuratively, it is the condition of being in a, what's the, I forget the word. It's an unused word. I, um, not a stupor, but I, I forget what it is. It basically means it's mixing, the first word is sloth-like. And the other words, on fire for God. It's like dead and on fire for God. Two completely different things. Like in him and not in him. Um, if you get a chance, go into the book of Revelation, look up the uh, Church of Laodicea and that word lukewarm and look up the definition. You'll see what I'm talking about. A torpor. A torpor, which is sloth-like, 
Bumatose dead. It's actually pretty wild when you see that definition and, and fully understand what lukewarm means. Um, so anyhow, let's let's keep going. Verse 30. Now, a good way from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. That, was it right with them? No, it was a good way away. Some people say, why were these Jews out there tending eggs with their unclean? Not what's going on. What is in this area is called the Topolis, the city, the area with 10 cities. They are Roman cities. There's also a Jewish city nearby. But the Topolis, um is the it's 10 cities. Um, and it's also good dairy. And they would raise pigs there. They were known as the black pigs of Gadara. It's interesting because this, the, and we'll get into this a little bit more in a minute. Let's go through the rest of this. And then we'll go ahead and wrap this up. So the demons begged him saying, if you cast this out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. So the demons want to go into an unclean place. Um, and he said to them, go. When Messiah said go, they went. Messiah has power over demons. So when they came out, they went into the, the herd of swine. And suddenly, the herd of swine gives you an idea how many demons there were in these guys. The whole herd of swines ran violently down to the steep place into the city and plunged into the water. Hmm. Do demons die? No. Pigs do. Demons get released. Um, yeah, no, unspiritual, you know, demons and angels do not die, and they cannot be saved if they fall. Um, it is through death, that the fact that we die, that we can be saved. Luckily, Messiah substituted his death for our death, so we don't have to die to get saved. And I could go on and on with that, but you get what I'm saying. Um, then, verse 33. Then those who kept them fled. And they went away into the city and kept money, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And they saw him. And they begged him to depart from, from the region. Hmm. You know, a few times that a bunch of people came out to Jesus and said, Damn, we don't want you. And I feel sorry for them people. Um. There's a, you know what the problem is here? Those pigs were very valuable. They just lost a lot of money. They did. Um, where I got to more of the story? Give me a second here. As I mentioned, because of the location, it's known that these were the um, black pigs of Gedalia. They were they were special pigs that were used for um, pagan sacrifices, specifically for the sacrifice of Saturnalia. I'm going to spell this out in case anybody want to look it up. S a t u r n a l i a, where they would sacrifice this pig. Saturnalia eventually became Christmas. Uh, Messiah was not born on Christmas. They just took the pagan feast days and Rome repressed them, but they're still celebrating them. That's why right, that's through Rome that you have the origin of a Christmas ham sacrificing this pig. You should also think back to like um, Antiochus Epiphany, Epithecus. I mispronounced that. Him salt, um, him sacrificing a pig on the altar. It would have been one of these pigs that they were raising in this area. Um, there's more to the story. I mean, there's one more thing I've got to share with you that's really cool. I think it's really cool. But it's not found here. It's going to found, it's, we're going to go to Mark. Mark, what is it? Oh, I have seven. I just have the verse number. Give me a second here. Mark 5. Okay, this is where we picked up 
uh, from Matthew in, in verse 17, and they began to plead with him to part from their region. And then when he got into the boat, Messiah got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed uh, begged him that he might go with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, and said in, in, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had com, uh, compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, there's ten cities, all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. This is actually pretty cool. Uh, think about these. These were the cutters, the guys breaking the chain. They were fit, fierce that nobody would go into that area because of them. And Messiah changed them. Dramatic thing. But he said, hey, can I come with you? Hey, I've got an idea for my own ministry here, and this is how I want to minister. I want to come with you. And he said, no, I want you to go over here and do this other thing. So sometimes in our lives, we have this thing that we're sure that God wants us to do, that we're supposed to be doing, but God takes you in another direction. And I've had that happen to me before. Um, actually, this is one of those directions he took me. That's been pretty cool for me, I think, and pretty cool for the kingdom. But um, the capitalists, now think about this. You know, imagine if you're in the city and these wild, crazy, like, people are now, like, talking sane and talking about this Jesus guy, you're going to listen to him because you see the change that has happened in this man or these men, whichever it is. The Capolis is an area in 70 AD uh, when uh, Jerusalem fell. A lot of the Jews fled from there, and they came to the Capolis. And what they found were churches that welcomed them in. They found refuge in this area because of the work these demon-possessed men that Messiah transformed that these Jews fleeing Jerusalem found refuge. You know, I, I, it takes me to like Paul, and I think about Paul, you know, Paul's like, you know, in, I mean, Paul had more faith than I probably ever will. But I mean, there had to be times when Paul's in Rome and he's under in jail or, you know, house arrest. And he's thinking, oh, man, if I could just go out on one more mission trip. That one more trip. If I could go and see these people over in the Corinth again. No problem, big deal. But all I can do is sit here and write a few letters. Yeah. Best thing that could ever happen to him. So don't let your circumstances define your ministry. Because God's going to, sometimes God will put you in circumstances to give you a ministry. Uh, anyhow, I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to share more about that. But um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there. And anyway, I thank you guys so much for watching. And we will pick up in uh, chapter nine next Saturday. God bless you. Have a great day.